Okay, so <clears throat> today what we'll start doing is looking at uh, C13 NMR. Uh, we spent a lot of time the last couple of days looking at um, uh, proton NMR, which allows you to look at the protons in, uh, in a molecule. Um, and C13 has the advantage of allowing you to look directly at the carbon backbone of a compound. And so there's, there's information you can get in C13 NMR that you can't get in proton NMR. Um, so let's talk a little bit about C13. And the nice thing about C13 NMR is that the principles that we've used for proton NMR are exactly the same. Um, and uh, so the, the concepts are pretty much the same except for a few, except for a few little uh, minor issues. Um, so what we will do then is, um, I need to get a timer. Uh, what we'll do then is um, sort of talk about C13 in general. So C13 NMR. Well, C13 NMR is, it runs in the same way as protons. So the C13 uh, uh, nucleus has a, an even atomic number, but it has an odd mass number. And therefore, carbon-13 is the only isotope, common one at least, of a carbon that is NMR active. And the same thing happens. The dipoles are randomly aligned in normal circumstances. You apply a magnetic field. It acts as a frame of reference, and your dipoles align themselves relative to it. There are two orientations relative to the field. Excuse me. If this is your B0, I will get uh, my nuclei aligned with the field in the so-called parallel state, and then some aligned against the field in the so-called anti-parallel state. There will be a delta E generated um, that delta E is bridgeable by photons in the uh, radio uh, wave region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and the delta E value varies with the B effective. And the B effective, again, depends upon the size of B0. So B effective is equal to B0 minus the B induced, which is the local field that... Um, the electrons around the carbon um, generate in, op in opposition to the field. So carbons that are attacked, that are attached to heteroatoms are strongly deshielded, and therefore their B induced is low, and so the B effective value will be high. Carbons that are attacked, that are attached maybe to perhaps other carbons, which are electron releasing, are going to have a large electron density, of a very high B induced, and therefore a low B effective. And therefore, I'm going to get two very different uh, delta E values, and I'm going to get two different frequencies of, of, of light absorbed. I'm going to get two different uh, values of the spectra. So, um, the uh, one second. Right. So we get a uh, couple of different B effectives, and so we get our uh, carbon nuclei absorbing at different uh, resonance frequencies. Well. There are a couple of differences between uh, C13 and proton. And the differences are fairly significant. One is that the carbon nucleus is, suffers from two problems. One is that C13 is, has a very low abundance. So the natural abundance of proteum, which is H1, is huge. I mean, it's by far the most abundant isotope of, 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 of hydrogen. It's well above 90-something percent. So when I look at a molecule, most of the protons in the molecule are protium. Um, and so when I run the proton spectrum, you know, it's not a big deal. You know, in a sample of, 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 of 1,000 molecules, there, there are tons of protons around. All of them, most of them are protium. So I can get a pretty intense signal. But the abundance of C13 is less than a percent. Um, in fact, it's much less than a percent. And so if I look at a sample of, say, methane, in a thousand molecules of methane, you might find 10 of them that are C13. And so when I run a sample of those thousand molecules, the abundance of carbon in that of C13 is so low, you barely get a blip because the natural abundance of carbon 13 is very low. So you have a sensitivity problem when it comes to C13. The other problem is there's, there's a constant called the magnetogyric constant of gamma or the, the, the gyromagnetic constant, gamma, which is a reflection or a measure of each nuclei, each nucleus's sensitivity to the NMR phenomenon. And again, in protons, in proton NMR, that number is huge. 
but in C13, the number is pitifully small. So there are two things working against the C13 NMR. One is that the natural abundance of carbon-13 is very, very low. And two, the sensitivity of the carbon-13 nucleus is also abysmally low. And so coupled together, it means the, N this, the NMR experiment for C13 has a very low natural, has a very low sensitivity, and so you have a lot more work to do to get a decent C13 NMR. So the way we, the way that is typically solved is that the NMR instrument has become extremely sensitive over the last 20, 30 years, and that compensates for the low sensitivity of the experiment to begin with. And then secondly, typically what you do is you run the NMR on a larger sample. So, for example, in proton, you can get a good proton NMR with one meg, maybe five megs of a sample. Typically in C13, you'll run a sample with uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 megs of sample. And in a proton, you can run a good NMR in eight scans, eight 16 scans. With C13, you'll probably run a couple hundred scans. So I'll take, um, I can run an NMR, proton NMR experiment in two minutes. I'll run a C13 with 25, 50 megs in the course of an hour and a half, okay? Um, that coupled with the sensitivity of the instrument allows us to compensate for the low abundance of C13 and the low sensitivity of the carbon-13 nucleus to the NMR phenomenon. So the ways around it. The other issue with the C13 has, which is a good thing, is that if you look at a proton NMR spectrum, right, if you look at a proton NMR spectrum, the spectral window typically runs from 0 to about 12, right? Um, normal protons fall in the region uh, 0 to 12, right? So I have TMS here. I've got cyclopropanes a little under 1. I've got methyl protons at about 1. Uh, I've got vanillic protons at about 5. I've got aromatic protons at about 7. Aldehydic protons at about 10. Carboxylic acid protons at about 11, okay? Um, and as we've seen in several questions, it's possible for my signals to overlap. And so what happens is in proton and MR, overlap is a significant problem because your spectral window, where you're cramming all of your signals, is pretty narrow. And so the chances are you're going to overlap. Plus, not all of your signals are singlets. So if you're going to be getting you know, triplets and quartets and so on and so on, chances of overlap when the peaks are spread in a narrow window, chance of overlap is going to be huge. In C13, the spectral window is much wider and runs typically from about 0 to maybe as high as um, maybe 220, right? And this is also a, a, a PPM, right? And you also have delta values on horizontal axis. So the chance of overlap in C13 is really very low, and that's a good thing because it means you can, you can tend to get very discrete signals in C13 and MR. That's a good thing. One of the differences in C13 and proton NMR um, is that if you look at proton NMR, we mentioned that there's several things you want to look at when you're confronted with a spectrum. One in proton NMR is the number of signals. Right? The number of signals tells me, at best, how many different kinds of protons are on the molecule. We talk about overlap, and sometimes funny things happen, and I have five signals, but there are really seven different kinds of protons. Right? Two is the multiplicity, right? Am I looking at singlets, doublets, triplets, quartets, multiplets, multiplicity? And what that tells me is the number of nearest neighbors. So how many H's are on the carbon next to me? Three is the uh, chemical shift, which tells me what kind of proton I'm looking at. H attached to methyl that is um, bound to... Uh, an O, so H on carbon and O is at 3.5. H on carbon attached to carbonyl is about 2.4. H attached to the benzene ring is about 7. H attached to O attached to carbonyl, carboxylic acid, is at 11. So the delta value tells me what kind of proton I'm dealing with. 4 is the integral. And the integral tells me how many protons I'm looking at. And then we mentioned briefly the coupling constant. And that is, tells you which kind of protons, uh, which proton is interacting with which proton. So there are five things you look at in a typical proton NMR. In much the same fashion, when I look at C13, 
I want to look at the number of kinds of number of signals. The number of signals tells me how many different kinds of carbons I'm looking at. For example, suppose I tell you I'm trying to distinguish between uh, the, the pentane. So uh, I've got uh, one, two, three, four, five. Oh shoot! Um, I'm trying to distinguish between the different pentanes. So one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Um, let's see, uh, one, two, yeah. Okay, so I'm trying. I'm running a C13 to distinguish between those three pentanes. Um, what would I find? This one will give me one, two, three, four signals. Right, so one, two, three, four different signals. This would give me one, two, three. Uh, signals, right, because these two are equivalent, these two are equivalent, this is unique. So I'm going to get three signals for this one. This is going to give me two signals, because all of these carbons are equivalent, this carbon is unique. So I'm going to get two signals in my compound. So I can tell immediately which pentane I have just by the number of carbon-13 signals, right? One gives me two, one gives me three, one gives me four. Right, so the number of signals, the number of different kinds of carbons. The chance of overlap in C13 is remote, I and mean, we can make it even remoter still using certain techniques we'll talk about in a second. What about the multiplicity? Well, the n plus 1 rule that we learned in Proton and MR still applies. So what this means is um, a carbon which has one, which has no neighbors that are NMR active will give me a singlet. A carbon that has one neighbor that's NMR active will give me a doublet. Carbon that has two neighbors that are NMR active will give me a, tri a triplet and so on. But the problem with C13 is as follows. And let's take a nice simple example like our uh, 2-methylbutene. If I run 2-methylbutene, I've got a carbon here, a carbon here, a carbon here. Now remember, coupling is 3-bond coupling and 2-bond coupling. So, for example, if I were to look at, um, say, the protons in, say, propane, these three methyl protons are equivalent. They don't split each other. So they interact, they couple, but they don't split. And so although there is one two-bond coupling, I don't see it because they're equivalent. What I do see is the one, two, three bond coupling. So these three H's appear as a triplet. These two H's would appear as a septet because I've got um, three H's here and three H's here. Okay. If I look at the carbon, however, this carbon is one bond from that carbon. But there's going to be coupling for that. It is two bonds from that carbon. There's coupling for that. And then it's three bonds from these two carbons. So on this carbon backbone, I'll see J1, right, coupling here, J2, coupling here, J3, right? So I'm going to see three different kinds of coupling. One bond coupling, two bond coupling, three bond coupling. It gets worse. Because on this carbon, there are three protons. And even though I'm not observing protons in a C13 NMR, the protons are there. And when I apply B0, those protons become active. So this carbon is also one bond from these protons, and so couples with those. It is one, two bonds from those protons, couples with those. And it's one, two, three bonds from that proton, couples with those. So these carbons, this carbon sees tons of coupling. It couples here, 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 here. So the multiplicity of that signal would be huge, right? It, that one carbon signal would be split into a very broad signal because of the coupling, because of the, the, the splitting. The problem with that is I will not even be able to recognize the splitting pattern because it's going to be a, a huge, weird, morphed multiplet. And secondly, the advantage I had gained by having a wide spectral window I would start to lose if a single signal is split into a broad multiplet. I'm going to start to get overlaps. So the multiplicities in C13s are a problem because there's just so much coupling. How do I fix it? 
And the answer is I fix it in two different degrees. It depends on what I want to do. So, for example, I can do something called single frequency off resonance decoupling. Single frequency off resonance decoupling. And in the single frequency off resonance decoupled spectrum, what I do is I blind the carbon to all protons in the molecule except the ones it's bound to. Now, I'm only talking about blinding the carbon to protons. Why am I not talking about blinding the carbon to other carbons? And the reason is, well, because the abundance of C13 is so low, not only is the probability of finding uh, C13 in a molecule of 2-methylbutane low, right? The probability of finding two C13s in a 4-carbon molecule is, rem is virtually negligible. So the likelihood of finding two C13s in coupling distance, whether my molecule is 2 carbons, 10 carbons, or 20 carbons, the likelihood of finding two C13s in coupling distance is very, very small. So I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to say that's not going to happen if, if the probability is essentially minuscule. So of the problems we identified here with this carbon can couple with other carbons and so on, or with H's, I'm not worried about the carbons. I am worried, however, about the coupling of the carbon to protons. And it, the carbon can couple to the protons attached to it directly, the protons on the near neighbor, and the protons on the next neighbor. So I'm worried then about this carbon showing up as a quartet split into a doublet, in, into a triplet, split into a, by, into a doublet. In other words, the splitting of this carbon by those three H's should give me a quartet. Right? And the way, in fact, it's normally drawn is I'd say, here's my carbon signal split into a quartet. Right? This is my quartet. But then the quartet is now split by these two H's into a triplet. So each of these is now split into a triplet. Right? But then it's also split by this H into a doublet. And so what you get is each of the whoa, whoa, whoa. what you get is each of these lines now split into a doublet. And you're going to start to get overlap of your peaks, right? So what should have been a nice simple signal may now give you right any number of peaklets, right? And this is essentially what, what your diagram would look like. And what this translates to then is when you run the NMR, you get this. So each peak in the NMR corresponds to one of those. And this is virtually, you know, illegible. So I don't want that. So if I do a single frequency off resonance decoupling experiment on this molecule, this carbon only sees these three protons. It does not see these. And therefore, this carbon shows up as a quartet because it's got three neighbors. The n plus 1 rule applies, and so that shows up as a quartet. This carbon is blind to all other protons in the molecule except the ones bound to it. And the two of them, n plus 1 rule applies, this will be a triplet. This carbon is bound to 1H. It's blind to all the others. It shows up, therefore, as a doublet. So what this essentially means in C13 is... CH3s appear as quartets, CH2s appear as triplets, CHs appear as singlets, and carbons devoid of Hs appear as, um, oh, sorry, as singlets, uh, uh, CH2, CHs appear as doublets. Okay, so let me just make sure I correct that. CH3s, quartets, CH2s, triplets, CHs, doublets, Carbons devoid of, of H's are singlets. And that's, that's, that's really good. Um, sometimes you still get overlap. And what some people do is they run what's called a fully decoupled spectrum. And if I run a fully decoupled spectrum, I basically blind the carbon to all the H's in the molecule. Those bound to it and those not bound directly.
And so what I get is singlets. All the carbons appear as singlets. So in fact, in the typical C13 NMR, the way it's normally run is I would run both experiments. So I'd run the single frequency of resonance decoupled NMR, and I would run the fully decoupled NMR. And what I would get then would be a series of peaks in the C13, right? And then the, 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 uh, the, the this is from the sim, this is the fully decoupled, and then the system will tell me in the in the single frequency of resonance, this really was a quartet, and this was a singlet, this was a doublet, that was a quartet, that was a triplet, that was a quartet, that was a singlet, singlet, doublet, whatever, <coughs> triplet, triplet. So I would know then, really this then is two C13s combined. This tells me that's a methyl, that was a, um, a carbon with no H's on it, that's a CH, that's a CH3, that's a CH2, that's a CH3, carbons with no H's on them, CH2, CH2s, right? So I can tell what kinds of carbons I have from the uh, combination then of the single frequency of resonant decoupled spectrum. Okay, so um, that's multiplicity. So when I look at a C13, like with NMRs, I look at the number of signals, which we uh, looked at, and the multiplicity. Um, what about the delta values? Well, the delta values are subject to exactly the same factors that proton delta values are subjected to, right, or subject to. That is a combination of inductive effects, electron releasing groups withdraw electrons, D shield, delta value goes up. That is resonance effects. So if by resonance a carbon is a fed electron density, then its delta value goes down. If by resonance a carbon is bled of electron density, then its delta value goes up. And anisotropic effects. So if the anisotropic effect is such that the carbons are bled of electron density, or, let me rephrase that, if the applied field is in concert with the, with the um, uh, direction in which the electrons circulate, then I get a high delta value. If the applied field is in opposition to the direction in which my electrons circulate, I get a low delta value. So all the same things we discussed for, C, for proton NMR apply for C13. Um, and I will put on, on Blackboard a copy of a correlation table um, that basically will tell you if my carbons are um, uh, sp3 hybridizers and alkanes, the delta value runs between 0 and about maybe, maybe you know, 40 or 50. Um, if they're sp2 hybridizers and alkenes or aromatics, it's about 80 to 140. Um, if they're sp hybridized, they're about 80 to 100. Um, if they are aromatic, they're about 110 to 150. Um, if the carbon is sp3 hybridized and bound to a halogen, it's about 50 to 60, and so on and so on and so on. So I'll put that up for you guys to look at, um, uh, and you guys can have a look at those. So much as with proton and MR, there is a correlation table that will give you chemical shifts for are carbons based upon their chemical environments. So, um, as, with, uh, C as with proton and MR, the number of signals, the multiplicity, and the chemical shifts are important. What about integral? Well, in proton and MR, the integral is important because, um, for example, if I look at this compound, I would get a signal for 3 H's, a signal for 2 H's, a signal for 1 H, and a signal for 6 H's. Right? And that tells me how many protons I'm looking at um, in my sample. With C13, there's a problem. And the problem is that C13 nuclei are insensitive to the NMR phenomenon. And that means not only is there difficulty with them being excited, but there's difficulty with them being relaxed. So once they're in the excited state, once they're anti-parallel to the applied field, they eventually have to decay or to relax back down to the ground state. And why is that? If they're not back in the ground state, they can't pick up another photon and be re-excited. But it turns out that C13s can piggyback, they can piggyback their relaxation down a proton. Because remember, the protons are perturbed when I apply my field. And the protons relax very quickly because they're sensitive to the NMR phenomenon. 
So they excite rapidly, they, 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 they decay rapidly. And if a carbon is bound to an H, then it can piggyback down the H's magnetic vector and relax rapidly. The problem is, the more H's that the carbon is, has attached to it, the faster it relaxes. In other words, the fastest relaxing protons are the, the fastest relaxing carbons are methyl. The slowest relaxing carbons are the carbons devoid of H's. So why is that a problem? It's a problem because suppose I'm running the NMR of, let's say, this compound. Right? I'm running the NMR of, say, uh, propanoic acid. I'm going to run the C13. In C13, I have a methyl carbon, a methylene carbon, and a carbon devoid of H's. So that's going to give me, in the, in you run the NMR, you're going to get a quartet, you're going to get a triplet, you're going to get a single. Right? Okay. Here's the problem. The way you run the NMR is, as time progresses, right, you're going to do a pulse. And in the pulse, you're, this is all Fourier transform now, so, it's, so you're going to pulse and excite every C13 in the system all at once. You will do what's called a pulse delay, then a second pulse. Pulse delay, a third pulse, and so on. Now that's a typical one-dimensional C13 experiment. This distance is called, not that you need to know it, it's called a pulse width. That's how wide your pulse is. How many nanoseconds of duration is your pulse? This distance is called your pulse delay. What is the spatial interval, the temporal interval, between the end of the first pulse and the start of the next pulse? Here's the problem. A carbon bound to three H's, for example, a methyl carbon, excites as all the others do, and then it decays. But it decays rapidly. So that carbon, that's a methyl carbon, is in the ground state by the time the next pulse arrives. So it excites, right? And then decays again, and is back in the ground state by the time the next pulse arrives. That's fantastic. A carbon that has two H's attached to it, will be excited in the first pulse with my methyl, but it only has two H's. So it decays pretty slowly. And it decays and may just barely miss being down in the ground state when the next pulse comes. So it doesn't excite. But when the, so I'm gonna put it here. So when, but when the next pulse comes, it gets excited. So what it means is, if I do three pulses, all methyls would have absorbed and come back down. My methylene would not have. The, 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 uh, the methylene is excited in the first pulse, not in the second, but in the third. So I only get two photons picked up for my methylene, but three for my methyls. And that would, that would suggest to me then that my methyl signal would be 50% bigger than my methylene signal. Or if you want, my methylene signal would be two-thirds of my methyl signal. But it's worse, because the carbon that has no H's on it relaxes extremely slowly. So at the first pulse, it excites with all the rest of its class. But it, it relaxes very slowly. So when I run three pulses, and I'm measuring the number of photons absorbed, the methyls absorb all the photons that we gave them. Three. So I get a high-intensity signal for my methyl. My methylenes took the first pulse, not the second, but was alive, was in the ground state for the third. So it absorbs two photons. My, my carbon having no H's absorbed the first one, wasn't in the ground state for any of the others. And so we use only one photon absorbed. So the intensities differ. And the intensities have nothing to do with the number of carbons. Because I have one methyl, one methylene, one carbon with no H's. But the intensity of the signals would be this would be tall, this would be intermediate, this would be low. So in C13 NMR, the intensity of the signal, the integral, is meaningless. 
it does not tell me how many carbons I'm looking at. It is a, it is a measure in part of the number of carbons, but is much more related to how many protons are on that carbon. So if I look at this C13 NMR, I can't say, well, this methyl group has twice the intensity of that carbon that has uh, no H's on it. So I must have had two times this than that. Can't do that. It may simply be an artifact for the fact that this carbon uh, relaxes extremely quickly. This one does not. So in C13, integral is not significant. Integral is not a diagnostic tool in C13. Okay? And then in a similar fashion, we don't use coupling constants in C13. So when I look at a C13 NMR, I am concerned with the number of signals, the signal multiplicity, and the delta value. Those are the only three parameters of consequence in a C13 NMR. Okay? Um, so what I will do for you guys is put up on Blackboard a, um, the correlation table and also um, a list of questions that you can try um, C13. So it'll be an inclusion of C13 questions, some proton and MAR questions, and some IR questions. And you can use those for, um, for practice questions. Okay, thank you.